G'day guys and welcome to Medieval Mayhem. On this channel you'll find lots of videos into the whole medieval period. You'll find videos into crafting your own costumes, DIY videos into furniture, we'll do videos into weapons, how they're used, we do reviews into other people's gear and we do analysis of historical events, who were the main characters and how did things turn out the way that they did. So if medieval is your thing you might want to consider subscribing. G'day guys, in this video I'm wanting to talk about single-handed axe technique. Very, very interesting weapon this. Uh, this would have been very commonly available, let's face it. It is a relatively short piece of wood, most likely ash, birch or oak. Potentially, potentially a harder version of pine, unlikely however. And a piece of bog iron, which then turned into an axe head. This particular one I got from a company called Medieval Fight Club. I really like this. This is a, a really nice lightweight piece of, uh, piece of kit. We'll talk about this particular axe head uh, a different time, but in terms of the actual combat itself, the axe is a very interesting weapon. It's less predictable, far less predictable than a sword. A sword it has a, um, relatively speaking, standard number of strikes, and defensive positions which uh, would have been relatively similar across cultures and across the whole period in, in the medieval ages. However, axes are slightly different. It, this would have been the common person's weapon and people would have been using an axe from a very young age. This is how little kids would have learnt to heat the home. This is how older kids would have been, you know, killing animals potentially learning how to defend themselves against wolves, bears, wild boar, foxes, that kind of thing. Uh, this is how you'd cut up some of that bigger, tougher meat. You know, this is it's how, uh, and this would have been a very familiar piece of kit to so many people of so many different ages. The actual strikes themselves are relatively simple. You can use an A shape, and it's a very simple, straightforward motion. I can adjust that in terms of my strikes. And in doing so, because I've got an oval shape of the head, I know exactly where the uh, point of the axe is. Therefore, I can use this to hook weapons out of the way and block a sword strike, or another axe strike, or a spear. And once I've done that and twisted my, mo my body, oh, I can then very quickly readjust the weapon for a counterattack. This is a butcher of a weapon. A sword is a gentle weapon. A sword is an entirely different weapon. This thing, as you'll know from reenactment circles, when you're using it and thrusting, you can adjust very quickly the, um, the kinetics of the, of the blade. Therefore, means that um, I can come in hard with a strike, but adjust essentially at last second so that I don't really hit the person too hard. And so that makes it a much more sort of effective and realistic strike. And if you hit someone too hard, they're really not going to like you. And then in the next round, they're probably going to come back and hit you just as hard. However, in, in real time, this is also a symbol of power and would have been for people who could really afford it. This is an expensive, phenomenally expensive piece of kit. Oh. Um, and would not have been for the everyday person unless you captured one in battle or happened to find one, stole one. Um, more likely. But an axe is simply not designed the same way. And an axe is designed for me if I'm using this because, let's face it, I'm going to have one, all my kids are going to have one, and therefore they can protect them themselves from, you know, raiders and that kind of thing who might want to take them hostage or, you know, take them as slaves. But this, as a weapon, is a devastating thing. And I can use it to separate parts of your anatomy and slowly mutilate you into a piece of meat on the floor. It's very effective 
and it's not gentle at all. I can't use it gentle, it's just not like that. This is a, uh, a weapon where it's very easy to build a bit of kinetic energy into it and deliver with really hard force. There's strong evidence that in medieval cultures what uh, armies could have done is throw these into the shield wall. And you can't help but duck and weave because this is going to split a shield. Particularly the lenticular shields which were very lightweight, they would not have survived many hits. This is cheap, this is very inexpensive. I can, you know, happily have a few of these things. And therefore, once I've got a hole in a shield wall, the Anglo-Saxons and other armies of the time probably would have formed what was called a boar snout and pushed their way in to that uh, and exploited the weaknesses of the, the shield wall where the vulnerabilities would have been and then be able to uh, hack away at their opponents. As I say, this is a phenomenal weapon and the psychology behind it is very, very interesting. I'm a reenactor. I've been a reenactor for several years and I really know my way around a sword. I fight against swords, I train against swords on a regular basis. So I do understand how swords work and I'm fairly confident that I can defeat an opponent. As I said, this is a weapon where I can adjust the amount of strength into it and I can use it to subdue someone, which is really interesting because in the medieval periods, someone who I thought might have been able to pay a ransom, I would take prisoner. Let's face it, if I didn't think you could pay a ransom, there's not much point in me taking you prisoner, is there? So yeah, not like it's personal, but with this, I can't really adjust the blow strike. This is, is designed for hacking you apart and the psychology behind it is, is very much that um, of one of fear. Now if I can do this to one or two people and hack them to bits, let's face it, a couple of really good strikes to the shoulders, into the rib cage, or down into the shoulder. Phenomenal weapon this, and it doesn't take a great deal to shape it and craft it into something which is very useful on the battle space. Not only, as I say, hooking into and pulling apart shields, blocking weapons, and pulling into someone and causing some very horrific injuries. Once I've decayed, um, once I've uh, disabled my opponent, and I say it's very easy to do. A couple of broken ribs, broken shoulder bone, potentially a broken arm, they're gone. Um, it's just really not hard to do. Once that person's disabled, a simple axe thrust down into the, uh, the sternum or across the rib cage, and that's it, that person's out of the fight. I can take their, their primary weapons if I want to or just move on to the next person. All of my enemies around in front of me will have seen this. All of them will have seen this and the psychology that's now projected onto them is very much one of fear. They're going to know that I'm not someone to be messed with and I'm coming after them. It's very interesting. You can see it today on some of the helmet cam footage that's been provided by soldiers in the Middle East and in Afghanistan where once you get into that killing mode uh, a lot of people really do develop a very strong bloodlust. And, and you can read accounts of the Norman invasion of England at the Battle of Hastings, and you can really get a strong sense that there was this absolute bloodlust. The Normans just wanted to kill everyone. And the same same can be said for the, uh, for the Saxons. When the Saxons, when the Saxons fought at um, Stamford Bridge, and they slaughtered so many of the Vikings, uh, so-called Vikings. Uh, there was obviously a very strong bloodlust there. And these guys were out for blood. They were going to kill the enemy and not really take that many prisoner. Um, and we know that from the, the simple number of ships that returned back to Norway um, and the, the fact that Harold Goodwitson had to call an end to the slaughter and it is described as a slaughter because the, the uh, Scandinavian soldiers would have been so tired at the end of that, having run uh, the 20 or so miles, that's a phenomenal distance to run in battle kit. I don't think many people could do that these days. 
and then uh, and then go into a fight at the end of that. I don't think it was a very fair fight at the end at all. Um, but the same same can be said about the Scandinavians and the Battle of um, Fulford, where they defeated the Anglo-Saxon forces around uh, York and killed just so many people. Very few uh, hostages uh, were really taken at the time. Uh, comparatively, it was a slaughter. And so you can understand that um, something like this is, is going to project that onto people. Well, I understand that, you know, let's face it, a lot of the Scandinavian soldiers wanted to go off to, to Valhalla, Christians wanted to go to heaven, but um, no one necessarily wants to go in 17 different pieces, do they? So the basic technique of a single-handed axe, as I say, is a, a formation. Very simple. I can adjust the trajectory of my axe and the width of the A shape and I can make a very, very, very stable position. I can hold my position and it's going to be very difficult to come at me with any kind of weapon because I can block it very easily. I can hook against spears. I can force down uh, a sword or another axe. Come at me as you will. I dare you. Um, I can thrust forward with this. I can hook backwards. You can see the points of this axe. That's going to cause some serious, serious injuries. You're going to be disabled when after a few strikes of this axe and you're going to know this. Let's face it, everyone would have known at the time how devastating these weapons could be. Simply just striking left and right. I'm going to hit something. I'm going to take away. I'm going to break out your ribs. I'm going to break out into your arms. It doesn't even need to be that solid a hit as long as I can get a hit in. And we all know the story, or we all should know the story, of the Norwegian soldier at the Battle of Stamford Bridge who apparently was able to hold the bridge against 30 Anglo-Saxon warriors at the time. They would have been some of the very best that Harold Goodwinson had and they rushed the bridge. Now, Stanford Bridge was a very narrow wooden bridge that had a width of about two people. This dude stood up and he was hacking away and he killed 30 of the Anglo-Saxon Hiskals. That's comparatively speaking, trying to say that a guy stood on a bridge and was able to take out 30 modern day context. We're looking at SAS soldiers. We're looking at, um, you know, something like Delta Force, GSG-9, those kind of things. So for those of you who are in the modern context, that's what we're looking at. These were professional soldiers with the best equipment. So for a, a guy with an axe to take out these guys, these, these Anglo-Saxons, it tells you what a devastating weapon this could be. Alrighty guys, I really hope you enjoyed today's video. Um, please like, subscribe and share. I'll catch you in my next video.